Welcome to Sitcom Showdown, a podcast that reviews classic sitcom episodes and inducts them into our very own Hall of Fame. As usual, one of us has chosen a sitcom episode and the other guy has no idea what it's going to be. Will they already know it? Will they love it? Can they be convinced that it's worthy? Let's find out on the Sitcom Showdown. Hello and welcome to episode 69 of Sitcom Showdown. It's Jeffers here recording in the Sitcom Showdown podcast studio. And uh, I'm joined by Steve-O, who's recording not in the Sitcom Showdown podcast studio. So uh, thanks to the pandemic going around the world, we are going to try some remote recording, which we didn't necessarily need to do, but I just wanted to try it out. Okay, so tell us what transplanted sitcom from one country to another we're dealing with this time around, Steve-O. This month, as you know, we are doing transplanted sitcoms, which were taken from one country to another. And on Twitter, we put out a question uh, asking for suggestions, actually, of things to do. And I would wanted to do something that someone had suggested, so I chose a sitcom suggested by at TBH, Just Lorem. Uh-huh. Uh, so this came through on Twitter, this suggestion. And... It was to do a sitcom called Loved By You, which Just Lorem says, managed to take the already awful mad about you and make it worse. So we know where they stand in regards to this already. (laughs) So this sitcom, Loved By You, um, was a remake of Mad About You. And the episode we're doing is The Tape, which was season two, episode three, which was the only one I could find on YouTube. So that made it easy, didn't it? Didn't have to wade through a whole lot. So, this is the UK adaption of the US sitcom Mad About You, which is a show about a documentary maker with a dodgy track record and his far more successful wife. I'm ripping this off Wikipedia, as per usual. Mad About You was an American sitcom starring Paul Reiser and Helen Hunt as a married couple living in New York City. This ran on NBC from 92 to 99, winning numerous awards, including four Golden Globes and 12 Emmys. In total, there were 176 episodes broadcast over eight seasons, so it ran for ages and was really successful. And I guess so successful that in 2019, uh, a revival of the the show for 12 episodes was picked up. Mm. So that's a recent thing. And then back to Loved By You, this was put on the ITV network in the UK, as we've already said, and this ran for only two series, totalling 13 episodes from 97 to 98. This starred, in one of the leads, John Gordon Sinclair as Michael. Now, John's career got underway in the 80s. He did five episodes of a show called Hot Metal, which you might be familiar with. And in 1989, he did a show with Aid Edmondson called Snakes and Ladders, which is sounding pretty interesting that's a sci-fi comedy he also did an actor's life for me and nelson's column trevin mcdowell is the other coast co-lead or co-star she plays kate michael's wife now trevin's career ended in the late 90s and she appeared to do mostly one-off things uh, such as a role as rosamond vinci in middlemarch which was a period drama on the bbc Kim Thompson plays Becky, Kate's sister. She played Leslie Bainbridge in the first season of Brushstrokes, which I find interesting. Uh, Leslie Bainbridge was Lionel's daughter. He was the boss uh, of the painting company, if you remember that. I also notice that the narrator, because there is a short bit of narration in this show, and um, that was credited to Robert Bryden, who I thought might be Rob Bryden, who, of course, has become... Very famous, but was doing voiceover work back in the day. Uh, back in the day when this was being put out. So, I have watched a reasonable amount of Mad About You, both back in the day and recently. I snagged a couple of cheap <laughs> DVD sets of this, and I've watched it with my I've watched with my wife the whole first season, and we're now making our way through the second season of that. But I haven't watched any of this Loved by You. And, well, if you can only find one, epi- one episode of it on YouTube, it's no doubt or no, um, no surprise there. I don't recall it ever being on free-to-air TV in Australia back in the 90s. Alrighty, well, let's go and watch it. <laughs> it's 
6A, 6B. Oh, here, why 6C? Here we are. Now, wait, wait. What if he recognises us? Oh, he's not going to recognise us. Why, well, I don't know. You know, I had a friend, Davy, at secondary school whose dad had a deck of playing cards with dirty pictures on. And one day, years later, I was on a number 19 bus and I swear I saw the woman that was at Seven of Clubs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Just knock. OK, but can I just say, if he has watched it and he's a critique of us, I will be unable to continue living. Fine. <clears throat> So let's give you a synopsis of this episode. Yep. Oh, I did want to mention, before I get started, that this YouTube upload has had the ads cut out, and I'm assuming that they've done a good job of snipping those out and haven't cut any actual show. Um, so we open with a short scene of Michael and Kate in the kitchen, which is so brief it's almost immediately followed by the credits, which I thought were pretty neat. This is basically the camera panning around a cork board which, if you can imagine a cork board in the kitchen or something like that, has got pictures of them pinned up. It's got um, messages that they've left for each other and invitations to parties, things like this. So it gives you a pretty good snapshot of their life, which is um, a good intro. Then we really get started um, in earnest at a scene which is set in what appears to be a bar or a restaurant or something like that. They're having breakfast. And Michael is having a good old whinge about this documentary he's made on animal behaviour. He's complaining because the people he's made it for, this TV, uh, TV station, have put the title A Day at the Zoo on it, mm. which he thinks is just dumb. It's the kiss of death for this thing. And they're also proposing to put it out on the wrong day. I think it's a Saturday that they're wanting to put it out on, which he also thinks is going to be... Um, like a bullet to this thing. And so he's having a good whinge about that to Kate. And they get interrupted by the scatterbrained waitress, Lisa, uh, who's come to drop off their bill, then immediately forgets that she's given them their bill. Cool. Uh, yes, she's that kind of person. Kate is studiously ignoring Michael. She's reading the paper while he's having this, this rant. And she does notice an article in the paper about a charity who is making the very kind offer at the moment to come pick up your unwanted bits and pieces which they will uh, bundle up and take off to their warehouse or whatever they're doing with it. Uh, so she decides that this is a good opportunity to give their cupboards a good the cleaning out that um, they so dearly need. So <laughs> she makes this suggestion to Michael and he's not too stoked about it, I would have to say, but um, reluctantly agrees to help out. We pick back up in the flat they've returned and the, Kate's sister, Becky, is helping out. Well, helping out. I think she's actually on the scrounge for things that she can take home with herself. And Michael, he's also not really helping out very much at all. He's watching Die Hard. Uh, but he does say, oh, I'm doing this so that I can return those VHS tapes from the shelf back to the store. And that's, you know, that's helping out because I'm clearing space. That's his explanation. So they they start in the lounge room and then they move into the bedroom and there's some negotiations which take place because he wants to keep his chest expander and Kate wants to keep, keep some cheerleading pom-poms. Uh, I think the cheerleading pom-poms are a bit strange but we'll talk about that, that a bit more. Um, they also find a VHS tape which is appears to have been loitering at the back of their wardrobe. Now... They don't actually come out and say this, but it's presumably a videotape which he, being a filmmaker, has made of them in the act of lovemaking. Um, apparently they did have a chat about this quite a while ago, and he had agreed to get rid of it, but obviously just put it back in the wardrobe, um, hiding it there um, for later use. Yeah. They have, <laughs> they, they have another discussion about this videotape, which... Um, Kate ends up winning the argument and he says, yes, yes, I'll definitely get rid of it this time. Um, 
Next thing that happens is Becky comes out complaining about the lack of food in the flat, um, which apparently isn't really a lack of food, it's just food that she wants to eat, so she heads off to go and get some takeaway. It's a very strange scene next where Becky is in... She's returned to the cafe or restaurant or potentially bar where Michael and Kate were having breakfast. This must be their local uh, local haunt. So Becky's gone there to get some food. Lisa, the waitress, the scatterbrain waitress, thinks Becky is someone called Gary who supposedly has had a sex change. It's very strange, very strange. Um... Back at the flat now, Michael has returned from the bin downstairs and he confirms to Kate the tape has now been destroyed. But she, predictably maybe, is having second thoughts about this. Turns out maybe she didn't want to get rid of it after all. Um, And of course he says, well, that's good because I didn't actually get rid of it. And they decide they're going to sit down and watch it right now. But uh, of course they have to move the dog because the dog can't be allowed to watch such a thing. Uh, that would be all wrong. And after a bit a bit more chat, she asks him, have you never watched this? And he says, well, I almost did last weekend, but I didn't. I decided to wait for you. So they hit play, and the narration, and some narration comes on, surprisingly, saying, what day at the zoo would be complete, dot, dot, dot. This is um, a surprising turn of events, listeners and uh, somewhat alarming. Now, Michael theorises that the previous weekend when Kate was away and the courier arrived to pick up the finished edit, his finished edit, of the documentary he was making, he must have given their sex tape to the courier who then took it off to the family-friendly TV station. Cue even more panic by our couple. Now... What are they going to do about this? They go after a short scene. So they've left the flat. And then there's a short scene where Becky comes back to a deserted apartment and has a chat with the dog about where they might be. But they've gone, of course, to visit Mr Larkin, Michael's boss at the family-friendly TV station, to try and retrieve the tape. He says, yes, I have watched the tape, which causes them to squirm. And then they try and excuse themselves, excuse their behaviour, and he lets them ramble on in this fashion for quite a while before finally agreeing to exchange the tape they've got, uh, which they believe is the documentary tape, with with his tape. Uh, So that happens, that exchange. And what do you know? It's Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. That's not what they were looking for. Now... Michael says, if that is the case, what must have happened is that the sex tape must have gone to the video shop amongst the video tapes that he'd been watching the previous weekend when he returned those. So, what are they going to do? They head down to the video shop. They look, first thing they do is they look for Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan on the shelf, but it's not there. So, I guess the logical conclusion they come to is that it's been rented by someone in the intervening week or whatever. So they head over to Clive, who's uh, managing the store, to try and get the details from him of who's got it at the moment. Now, that doesn't work. He's a bit suspicious about the why they would want to have this information. So Michael says, uh, look mate, come over here and I'll have a little chat to you. And basically, he's trying to bribe the information out of Clive. But while he's doing that, Becky is very sneakily moving around to have a look on the computer and get the details off of that. So can I uh, get your opinion on this, though, Steve? Is He pulls you know Clive aside and says, Listen, buddy, I'll give you some cash if you give me the info of the person who who borrowed this tape. And meanwhile, we see Kate sneaky round the back to look at the screen, etc. Now, I don't think Mike was in on that. I think he was genuinely trying to do a deal. But, you know, Kate was very wisely sneaking around and doing the thing. Did you think they were they were in on it and that was the master plan? Or do you think it happened surreptitiously, uh, you know, just spontaneously? Okay. 
So, yes, I do think that this is Kate. Uh, in fact, I think Kate basically gets them out of trouble in pretty much every scenario through this episode. Um, and we've got another one coming up because they're going to go and visit now the guy who has rented Star Trek Wrath of Khan, who is a jovial fellow called Roy, who appears at his front door in a Starfleet costume. And seeing them, he immediately laughs and says, Hello! Which I guess the uh, the natural assumption is that he recognises them, and where where could he possibly recognise them from? Having their sex tape. Yeah. Yes. Now, did you recognise this actor, Jeff? No, but he was pretty good. Yeah, he was pretty good. This is Chris Walker. Yeah, uh, I think I might have seen him in the Bill because he was a regular on the Bill for a couple of years. Oh. Anyhow, Roy, he doesn't recognise them from the tape, because he hasn't watched that yet. He thinks he's recognising them from a convention last year. And then, uh, so they kind of get chatting a bit, and in an effort to get the tape off him, they pretend to be Federation officers. We're talking Star Trek Federation here. Um, So there's a bit of waffle about videotape, and then they do manage to retrieve it from him. And, yeah, they swap it over, don't they, for the real for the real Wrath of Khan tape. So they are managing, and again, this is Kate, who's leading the charge here to solve every one of these problems that they're finding themselves in. Uh, so that night, back at home, they they have actually now got around to watching the tape. They settled down in front of the couch, and um, they're asking themselves, you know, why don't we do that anymore? And there's a bit of bants, and she talks about him making a face, which is his, um, you know, this is a getting intense face. She says, oh, it's going to it's gonna finish soon. And he um, is a bit sceptical about this face and then takes her off to the bedroom so she can show him what the face looks like, essentially. And that's the end of the episode. Ah, oh, isn't that lovely? Is it lovely? No. Let's talk about whether it's lovely or not. Okay. Now, before we do that, yes. Um, are you still recording? I am. I can see numbers ticking over now. All right, brilliant. So I've got general comments. I've got jokes that worked. I've got jokes slash scenes that didn't work, and then I've got a comparison against Mad About You. Okay, okay. How does that sound? Yep, that sounds all right. So going through some general comments, I missed some of the main plot elements of this at least two or three times, like the first two or three times I watched it. And in fact, it wasn't until I watched the Mad, the Mad About You version of this episode that some of the penny dropped on some of these things. Huh. Like the bit where she's they're at the cafe having breakfast and she's got the paper and she reads the article about the charity. I didn't put that together with her idea the very next minute to clean out the cupboards and everything like that. I did. I didn't get that for ages. Oh, and um, also the bit about having got the video out the previous weekend. I have to admit, I did find all the videotape stuff a little bit, a little bit confusing. Yeah. Did you not? Um, because he's he's watching Die Hard in their lounge room while she's doing the uh, spring cleaning. Yeah. And he's talking about how he's going to take these tapes back. So he's obviously got a new batch of videotapes from the video shop. And we're also talking about the previous lot that he had, which had included the Star Trek one. Yeah. And then there's, of course, the other tape, which was at the back of the cupboard. So, yeah. Um, yep. I think maybe I was just being dense as well. What do you think? And there's the documentary tape. So there's four lots of tapes. The documentary tape. There's lots of tapes. I can see why he's confused. Well, yeah. Moving on. <laughs> the restaurant. I, I did. We've already talked about how it's a bit of a weird mix of a bar and a cafe and a restaurant. Yeah. And they're there for breakfast. Yep. Um, now, this is one of those things I think that doesn't translate so well from being a New York sit- based sitcom to a UK based sitcom. I reckon you're exactly right. She's fairly casually dressed and they're there for breakfast. Uh, it's obviously a place that they spend a lot of time at. Like she's reading the paper. It's, it's like they must be in there every day or every second day or something like that. Which yep. just seemed a bit strange to me. Yeah, and they know the name of the waitress. Yes. Well, you wouldn't forget her, would you? She's a bit of a character. 
Um, and the other thing I'm putting in that category of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, strange translations or something like that. These are the pom-poms. I mean, well, was cheerleading and pom-poms a thing in the UK in the 90s? No. Well, no, it wouldn't have been in the 90s because she's kept them from her high school days, I guess. Yep. So she well, let's say the, the early 80s. I mean, I don't think cheerleading was a thing in Britain. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I've got no idea. But let's no. safely assume that no, it's not. Listeners, uh, <laughs> let us know. Yeah. 1980s pom-poms in the UK. Was it a thing? Uh, some of the language, he says, by jings. Have you ever heard by jings before? Oh, yeah. Isn't that, isn't that a fantastic Scottish cliche? Well, I, did, I, dus- I discovered that it's a, a Scottish exclamation. Oh, okay. But I know it, did, it sounded a bit um, old fogey-ish. <laughs> yeah. 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 He calls her babe. He calls her babe, which was a bit cringeworthy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I have that written down. <laughs> and then oh. he goes back. He goes back. Uh, as they're on their way out of the video shop. He goes back to potentially rent Dr. Doolittle. Yeah, which is, is ridiculous. This, he was complaining earlier about how he's got to work for this family-friendly TV Thing. station. Yeah, and doing animal stuff. And doing animal stuff, but then he wants to rent Dr. Doolittle. Is this a joke? <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe it's inspired him. Yes, maybe he's found a new found, he's got a newfound love now for, yeah. for Dr. Doolittle. He can appreciate how hard it is to work with animals. Well, quite, and how hard it is to work with people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are some incredibly thick people in this episode. Yes. Uh, well, Lisa's Lisa's thick as a brick. Um, yeah. Roy is he is he just mad or is he thick? Um, he's, he's just lost in, in his, his own his, zone, he, I think. Yes, he's lost in the Star Trek fantasy. I think so. Much I mean, as, I, I think that the... worked all right, actually. Oh, okay. All right. But we can we'll get back that to that later on as well. Yep. And then. In the conversation with Mr. Larkin, the boss, he doesn't ask them, why do you want to change the tapes or ask any kind of, of any of the obvious questions. No, and they didn't just, ask him, what did you see on that tape? Yes, it all just They remains. just assume he's seen all the source and, uh, yes. you know, because they don't know about the... <laughs> the Wrath of Khan plot yet. Yes. Um, the whole thing remains ambiguous until they get out in the... <laughs> oh, goodness. Hallway? Hallway. The foyer. <laughs> the foyer. Um, yeah. yeah, no, this is the thing, is neither party asks the questions that would naturally come to hand, and it's actually, yeah. you know, it's it's a hard thing for the script to have to force people to not ask these natural questions, and so it's a bit contrived. Yes. But they will, don't I get will, asked. I will come back to that. Yeah. Um, and then the video shop mustn't check the tapes when they're received back in through the return slot or whatever, which, as you would well know, Jeff, was a thing. Yep. They would open the case, make sure that the right tape is in the right case and that the tape was there. Absolutely. And then they would they would do pretty much the reverse when it was going out the door. Yeah. Yeah. Um, still, we're not going to mark them down too much for that. Uh, <laughs> the, the actress who plays Kate... I think is not very good. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I think that's fair. I said not naturalistic anyway. And uh, there are a couple of examples. I think the worst one is the final scene where they're on their way through to the bedroom. And she says, go on then, take off your clothes, see if I care. But she <laughs> just, uh, the way she delivers it is just horrible. There are a few preliminary thoughts. What did you have under the similar kind of category categories? Well, yeah, I mean, getting back to what you were saying about oh, just then with the delivery of the lines. So I think these British actors, uh, they know that these lines have already been recited elsewhere extremely successfully, and maybe they felt the pressure was on them to do it in a slightly different way or to not repeat exactly it was done by Paul mm. Reiser and Helen Hunt. And so, you know, my observations about that are just they... It's like they're thinking too hard about it and they're putting so mm. much work into the delivery either to make it different or just to deliver the lines that it comes across as unnatural. Um, no, they're and also, overthinking it. 
Yeah, that's that's what I think is happening there. So and and it felt like it was missing the beats. So when I was watching, and I know later on you're going to do a comparison to Mad About You, but my thoughts on the thing were that, especially in the beginning, right? So in a coffee shop, that's a New York cultural thing anyway. But the yep. the banter, you know, as you were talking about the bands, and so these the beginning scenes, which are so cringeworthy, done by the British folks. There, it's culturally natural New York banter. It's free flowing. It's coffee shop complaining. It's not very British, and so you know what I mean. Helen Hunt and Paul Reiser are doing it really well, and they're doing it. Yeah. Um. It, it is like I said, it's free flowing, and they're doing it quickly. Mm. Whereas the same lines are delivered by the Brits much more slowly. It's not the sort of thing they'd be saying anyway. In the sort of place they'd be saying it. You know what I mean? It's hardly, yeah, yeah, where yeah, they yeah. are is hardly um, Bull Ent's Cafe and they're not going to bump into yeah. Count Arthur. <laughs> if you know, you no, know what a I mean? bit more upmarket. But yeah. you can't hear the, the um, oh no, we're already comparing it to the other one. Yeah. But um, it hasn't got the honking of the horns and the people yelling and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it hasn't got that kind of, um, all those elements that you don't really notice. They're not in the forefront, but no. they all contribute to the, the character of the thing. So it sort of fails that, you know, the whole bantery thing, which in America is all quite natural, I think. And also when they were delivering the lines, this is, you know, Helen and Paul, they, they were kind of distracted and almost not listening to each other, but they kind of were, whereas the others were... I oh, know. I mean, you know, for a start, Kate was reading the paper. And I'm thinking, if she's not interested in the conversation, why should I be interested in the conversation? You know what I mean? Well, to and be fair, also... I wouldn't have been interested in the conversation that he was he was <laughs> yeah. making anyway. Yeah, good point, good point. Um, but, yeah, going back even further than that, I dug what you were saying about the uh, their intro. Uh, they had going over the cork board with little things from their life. And in the American one, they have the, the snapshots of the black and white photos of Paul and Jamie <laughs> yep. together. But whereas in the British one, you've got Kate and Mike's little things on the board. But what it was missing is it was missing the theme tune from Mad About You, which I brought up previously in a different mm. episode, is that you get a lot from the lyrics of that theme tune that set you up for what's happening. Whereas yep. in the British one, you've got just this sort of smoky saxophone, very downbeat, putting you to sleep before you've even heard the first... <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it misses out on the theme tune, whereas the Mad About You theme tune is very upbeat. It's lyrically useful. And so, you know, you can do a lot with the theme tune and just the pictures. So I was thinking, which theme tunes um, set you up with the story before you mm. even start watching? And I was thinking, Welcome Back, Cotter. And I don't know if you remember <laughs> yeah, that. Sure. Yeah, that not only is it an awesome song, but it, it lyrically does tell you exactly what's going on in this sitcom, which the Mad About You song also does. Mm. Well, even the even the the title of it, "Loved by You," it is a bit derivative because it is derived. Uh, derived from what? From the original. <laughs> mad well, the about original you. was "Mad About You." Yeah, they can't they can't use that, so they've got to take something that's a derivative of that. Well, why couldn't you just take it? I don't they did know. It with the office and it worked. Oh well, who knows the mystery? I mean, they've taken the bloody script, word, <laughs> almost word for word. You think they couldn't take the title of it as well? Yeah. I don't know. Look, anyway, and then, getting back to my last thing before I hand it back to you is you know, it was a bit cringeworthy when he said "babe" to Kate. Yeah. Which is more of an American thing, but anyway, it's just what yeah. those two lines stuck out to me massively, and so then when I watched the American one. And sorry to keep bringing it back to America, but when I watched the American one, Paul Reiser, in the typical Paul Reiser way, said to Helen Hunt, he goes, this, my friend, is a piece of wood. Yeah. And I liked that because instead of calling her baby, he says, my friend, and that's because they're very much on an equal footing and mm. they are good friends and it's them against the world, whereas with our, our British pair, it's almost like they don't work together as much against the world outside. <laughs> I could be wrong because I haven't watched any it of the others. A, it was a strange move that they would take what was originally my friend mm. in the US version, change it to babe, which is an American, not more American type of 
phrase and then when it, he says it in a Scottish accent, it just sounds completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, all right. Strange what choices. You... Yeah, that's right. Uh, what have, what have okay, you got Okay, so next? for my extensive list of jokes that worked, <laughs> uh, I've got... I've got the joke where she's got her pile of things to throw out, which includes a piece of wood. And he says, you know, you've got you've got to keep that. You've got to keep that. And she says, well, what are you going to do with it? And he said, you, well, you've always wanted a country cottage. <laughs> yes. And that that's the end of my <laughs> list, of, jo- oh, list really? of jokes that work. Oh, no. Yeah, what else? Have, have well, you got something I, else? I was relying on you to write down more gags because I, my notes simply say... <laughs> Well, look, in the second half, right, I really started to believe what they were doing, amazingly. Ooh. Because in the second half, right, they're knee-deep in plot and things are mm. happening very quickly. So there's way more plot and less banter and things start to make more sense. And I, I have written down that there are some good gags in the second half that I thought were actually pretty good. Uh, but I didn't bother to note down what they actually were because I thought, oh, Steve might have that. Oh. Um, no. But yes, we'll just have to take it as read that there were some good gags. But here's what I liked. In uh, in the British version, they've made the chap who they have to get the Star Trek video off a trekker, whereas in the American one, it was RoboCop. And I think what the writers have done, because they barely change a bloody thing in this whole sitcom, and yet they take this whole bit and make him a trekker and change mm. up a whole bunch of lines. And that actually works in some ways better than the American one does. It works quite well. Um, and yet there was so much earlier than that they could have changed. Like they could have taken out the whole sister thing, all those scenes altogether. They could have taken out the Gary sex change scene at the bar, which added nothing. And Mm. yet they didn't change any of that, but they totally changed the Trekker thing. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But I think by making it a Star Trek person, it actually worked a hell of a lot better. Yeah, no, I do agree with you. That was probably one of the best sequences in the whole thing. Uh, how much of it's down to the performance of the the guy playing Roy? Um, mm. Could well be him because he's doing some good stuff there. Um, okay, so let's go on to the jokes and scenes which didn't work, which <laughs> you've just mentioned a couple of them. Uh, there's the joke about the sex change, which is pretty cringy. Yep. Yep. And I've also written down the scene where Becky comes back to the deserted apartment. And has a chat to the dog about yeah. where they've gone. And I was just thinking, why are either of these scenes in the show? It's like they needed a B-plot, but it was just missing. So they padded out five minutes with a couple of things. Yeah. I think the the waitress character in Mad About You was a pretty huge success, wasn't she? With Lisa Kudrow playing that character. Yeah, so here's so what they, I was confused about. Well, In the same way that Mad About You is literally linked with Seinfeld by Kramer renting Paul's apartment or whatever, I was yeah. wondering if that was the character Phoebe from Friends and they were at Central Perk or whatever and they were doing that. And see, the whole reason that whole waitress, in any of the waitress scenes exist is to capitalise on how good Lisa Kudrow is in that role. And that's the only reason the Americans have got that in the script there is my view and so then when you bring it over to britain you haven't got the same actress therefore what's the point it'd be like if they literally had a mad about you scene with kramer which they do in some cases and then you go to britain and you've got a different actor and you have to change the name of the character because it can't be kramer you'd think what is the point of that scene because it's you know (laughs) i don't know i'm not phrasing this very well but yeah that's exactly what i think happens i think uh, Paul Reiser writing the script for Mad About You. He realised he had another five minutes to to spare. He thought, what can I throw in? Oh, everyone loves the waitress character, so we'll have yeah. another scene there. Yeah, that's right. Yep, so I would have chopped both of those out and replaced it with something better. And this Other was another things... thing... Sorry, I keep interrupting you, but I'll, I'll have my yep. say, damn it. Um, this yep. is with the... You know, Lisa, the waitress, having that conversation with the sister about the whole Gary sex change thing, which is meant to be hilarious, but, you know, it's not. Um, It was barely passable in the American one. But the reason it is is because, like I was saying before, the British actors are doing it so much with each line that it takes twice as long. And I think if you timed it, the American version all happened in probably under 20 seconds, 25 seconds. 
But in the yeah. British version, it seemed like it went on for a minute and a half. They absolutely made a meal of it. It was um, it was incredible. It was so clunky. Yeah, the no. whole thing was so bad. It should have been sped up as much as possible. Yeah, or just chopped completely. Oh, that's right. They should have just chopped it out. If they can rewrite a whole section and make the dude a trekker guy instead of a a, a nut job renting Robocop, then uh, you know they can take some license elsewhere. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. The only other one I had, which was a bit of a head scratcher, was <laughs> when he says he's going to free up shelf space for her, oh so kindly by returning these videos. Yep. Um, he's pointing to the when he says the line he's pointing to the bedroom which is insane i'm thinking to myself your tv and your video recorder are right in front of you why are you pointing to the the bedroom is that where you keep your rented tapes this is yeah he hadn't read the script right he didn't realize what was going on because paul riser when he delivers it he's talking about the tv shelf right there with the tv cabinet yeah it makes makes perfect sense there yeah or maybe hey, see he's as confused as I am about these these tapes because <laughs> the the naughty tape uh-huh. the tape with the horizontal folk dancing on it that's stored in the yes yeah. the wardrobe and he's that's where it, he thinks that's where he's putting all these tapes or something I don't know what's going on it's, yeah it was a bit strange it was a bit strange um, <laughs> were there any other ones that didn't work that you thought oh blimey yeah. um. Worth mentioning. No, n- none that I've noted down. Yeah, it, it was better in the second half, as just to reiterate what I was saying before, and it seemed that there was some actual chemistry going on between the two because leads it, in the second half. Because it and, picked up a bit of pace, do you think? Yeah, it picked up a bit of pace as too, which is vital because it was quite slow in, in parts compared to the US version and all that sort of stuff. Well, the other thing, of course, is that I'm just loving all this hanging around in video stores. That's fantastic. <laughs> Ah, oh, and just looking at the covers oh, and going, right. wow, that was brilliant. It's a lovely walk down memory lane. Yeah, that's right. And look, I've, I've remembered one of the other gags is when Kate goes to shut the blinds, obviously, because someone two kilometres away with a telescope might be able to look through the window and see them playing the nudie Rudy tape. Um, yes. And, it, you know, it's an obvious gag where we've got to shut the blinds so no one sees and you go, ah. Oh. That's a reasonably mediocre gag, but then he goes, "Yeah, that's right," because I saw a lot of fifty-foot perverts hanging around down in the street, yeah, yeah, meaning yeah. that they're that yeah. tall they can just look through the third-story window, which that was, was right. a decent gag. I thought that was he delivered that very well. Yeah, yeah. I just don't get the whole get the they they rely on the dog a lot. Oh. The dog's so cute. The dog can't watch the tape. The dog's got to be taken into the bedroom. Yep. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Doesn't and they don't call it by its name. They just call it the dog. Yeah, that's odd because Murray is very much... He's a main character. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't recast Murray in the same way that you couldn't have a British version of Kramer or something. Yes. All right. Well, we, uh, seeing as we're comparing it all the time, let's talk about that a bit more. Oh, good. So, yes, as we've, as we've alluded to, uh, if not straight out said... They've basically taken the script of the same episode from the US, and with a few, with a few tweaks, um, and with the exception of that scene with Roy, which has been reworked quite a bit. It's essentially the same script which Paul Weiser wrote. Um, so it's interesting to watch the two side by side and compare what's going on. Yeah. What was your? Did you end up doing that? Well, I watched the American one after watching the British one. Right. So what was your immediate? Oh, my immediate, immediate uh, thoughts was the pacing. The pacing is so much better and it makes makes more sense. And and just like I was saying earlier about how it's natural part of their cultural conversation to be sort of, you know, they're polite, right? So the British are polite, but the New Yorkers are polite but confrontational. And they mm. they do have banter, and they're more snappy and with it, but genuine. And so I just yeah think the the characterisation and the pace is much more natural. Whereas the British version just then seemed oh I understand what's happening here. It's just slower, and it's it's not natural to them. Yeah, they're hitting a whole different set of beats in the the Mad About You version. 
Yeah. And also I think the the Mike character as opposed to Paul Reiser's Paul character, the Mike character seems like when he's explaining what's happening with the the videotapes and how it all got messed up and how he's been hiding this tape and then he didn't burn it the second time either and all those things where he's having to explain to Kate. It sounds like there's there's a slight difference, right? So what he's doing, what Mike is doing is confessing and he's yeah. sort of throwing himself on the mercy of the court whereas when Paul does it He's explaining what happened. Like he's Mike seems like this squirming fibber who's been caught, right? And he's under yep. the thumb. Whereas Paul genuinely believes his case. He's not confessing. He's saying what happened. And because he's explaining it, and what he's doing is when he's telling Helen Hunt, he's replaying it in his head and saying out loud to remember what happened. You know, like yep. you know when you've lost your keys or you've lost that thing, and you go. Okay, let's backtrack. I came in and I turned oh, here yeah. and I put something, in, and that's how he's doing it. Whereas when Mike's doing it, it's like he knew exactly what he did and he knew he was wrong, and now he's sort of having to confess. Mm. Yeah, and that's a slight difference Very in how they deliver the lines. Huh. Mm. Very good. Oh, thank I you. I do Mary. have. Uh... <laughs> I've got a quote here from Gary Berman uh, in his book. Best of the Britcoms, from Faulty Towers to the Office. This sounds great. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this paragraph uh, is quite relevant. He says, One of the top American sitcoms of the 90s, Mad About You, has been transformed more or less into the British Loved By You, starring John Gordon Sinclair. Of course, Paul Reiser's comic vision and delivery aren't easy to get across without Paul Reiser. Helen Hunt has proven herself to be equally irreplaceable. Also, picturing Mad About You without its unbilled co-star, New York City, proves a tough challenge. That's so well put. Yes, I thought so. Um, the two leads are very, very good in Mad About You, and I think watching them run through exactly the same script, uh, they elevate it. Obviously, there's a bit of editing and direction that goes along with that, but... They're taking it from what? Well, what would you rate the uh, Loved by You episode? Uh, out of five. Ah, oh, I'd give it a yeah. Well, I say two out of five, but in some ways that seems generous. Um, but yeah, I'd give it a two out of five. Yeah, I'm thinking again, like a one or two, something yeah. like that. But I'd say, you know, the the Mad About You episode obviously had some some dud gags in there, but they rattle through it uh, so quickly that it's redeemed a bit by the delivery and the quickness of everything that's going on. So it's, it easy, easily elevates it, the same script by one or two stars, I would say. Yeah, I that's totally agree. Lot. And uh, yeah, I also liked what you were saying about Mad, about Mad About You having New York in the background the whole time and it being a difficult thing to translate into the UK setting, that vibrancy and everything like that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, are these two, uh, Mike and Kate, are they in London? I'm guessing so. Yeah. I suppose there's similarities there, but, yeah, you're not... Uh, it, imagine trying to do Seinfeld not in New York City. You know, it'd yeah. be difficult. Oh, Now, look, well, where are we, we and, and what, what, what have we left to say? I don't know. Probably nothing. <laughs> uh, we've, we've rated it. We've said what didn't work. We said what did work. Well, I think we've just about we've done everything. Yeah. Look, this whole experiment has been uh, quite fun, I've got to say, and I could happily do a year of that sort of thing. Mm. You know, watching these uh, transplanted comedies and such. Mm. Even though yeah. it's amazing we say that, that it's been quite enjoyable when we've just trash-talked the two sitcoms that we actually <laughs> selected. <laughs> it's true. It's true, but it has been really interesting doing one where they took the script almost verbatim and redid it, reshot it, and then there was the one, um, the one we did last time, the Faulty Towers makeover, and that yeah it took a completely different approach, mm. basically completely fresh script. Yes, oh, I agree. It was very good fun. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. I think so. Yes, thanks for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. And we'll see you again next month. April, what are we doing in April, by the way? Well, we it's going to be my turn, and then it's going to be your turn. To nominate five-star episodes? Uh, yep. Or as is more often the case, to 
just nominate whatever we think is great, whether it's five star or not. Well, speak for yourself. I only I only nominate the cream of the crop, Jeff. Even if you don't think so. Um. Well, yes, indeedy. Um. Yes. Yeah, so it'll be my turn, and I, I'm going to nominate something, and I can tell you in advance, it is going to be British. Oh, okay. That, that narrows it down for you, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Or it narrows it right down <laughs> to about 2,000 possibilities. Yeah, exactly. All right, I'll look forward to that. And uh, listeners, we'll catch you in about a fortnight. Cheers. Bye. Join us next time on Sitcom Showdown when we'll be putting another five-star episode under the microscope. And in the meantime, you can contact us with feedback on Facebook, Twitter at Sitcom Showdown, or by email sitcomshowdown at gmail.com. 